Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and as a reminder once again namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken it's called Brahmi and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In la catch comes from the other side of the world the Mayan civilization and it means I am another you. So imagine if we could approach life and each other with that kind of mindset, the difference it would make in our lives. Okay, okay. so this week's guest is Douglas Breitbart. He is the co-founder of Being in Systems, LLC. Cool name, huh? And he's also, um, he's a lawyer. He graduated from Fordham University School of Law. Now, in his co-founding Being in Systems, they say that uh, we catalyze the awakening of individuals to their agency, voice, value, and generative potential. That's key there, generative potential. By catalyzing the awakening, we enable connected individuals in groups, teams, and organizations to realize their greatest vision and contribution of value in service to themselves, each other, their organization, and the world. Doug, such a pleasure to have you here. Namaste. <laughs> so, you know, you've, you've had quite a, a interesting, circuitous path through life. And, uh, you know, did you know that when you were young? <laughs> did you have any idea of how life was gonna be for you? You know, it, it's sort of a perfect question. I recently, um, was introduced to an energy healer. And I hadn't really had experience with, with that modality um, before. Mm -hmm. And, and in, one of her, in one of her readings, she said, you know, while she's working, she sort of, you know, throws out questions. And, um, and she looked up at me and she goes, so like, you've known about your sovereignty a long time, right? And, and I paused and I thought about that for a second. That's the question you just asked. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I realized, yeah, like I didn't know much else. I wasn't connected. I didn't feel much else. I didn't have much else. But there, this one little thing, this one little sort of consciousness of um, I'm here for a reason. I'm here for, uh, to make a contribution, to be in service and of value. And I have something to offer. Didn't know what. Um, and it wasn't uh, an ego expression. It was a, just a internal just a knowing. Internal knowing. Yeah. And, and, and as when she asked it, I was like, damn, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've known that forever. It's the only thing I've known forever. Everything else, not so much. But I can relate. Now and and and, and, and today I can find you know actually like connect the dots. What the, it was. Well, that's what I would <laughs> ask. Okay, so so connecting the dots, you know, putting the layers of the onion back on, so to speak. Um, and you might have taken them off from time to time, sure. However, in that process, you how did you incrementally? get in touch with what that service might be? Well, I, growing up, um, I was youngest of two siblings and I was um, sort of the curly red haired stepchild. So I had my nose pressed against the glass, but I sort of didn't exist. And um, so I sort of, I sleepwalked all the way through most of the first third of my life. So I uh, did things, experienced things, accomplished things, that, you know, on paper, in principle, is a pretty rich soup. But my uh, level of 
emotional connection non-existent mm. my level of sort of consciousness awareness of large swaths of the way the world worked the way people worked, the way relationships were were blank blank slates um i was i would characterize it as you know a, a contemporary version of a of a neanderthal and um and notwithstanding that you know i you know graduated at ivy league college i you know got a law degree did graduate work in geography um satellite remote sensing data analysis and um i saw the world you know round one and a half times and um did a lot and was busy and ended up in the entertainment industry part of past life um, because it was the only the only business that in which people paid you to pay attention to whatever it was you were putting in front of them. Mm. And that seemed like a very powerful thing to me. Absolutely. And even with, you know, your, your comments about being a Neanderthal, you were still really busy. I mean, I know what it takes. I've got a couple of master's degrees, but I, I know that even going through the rigors of, you know, your pre-law and, and law degree and, and then building a practice and, and all that kind of stuff, that's a tremendous amount of focus. And it's not surprising, like many, you know, up until they're 30, right, that you're focused on setting your life up. And the other things may or may not have anything to do with it because you're driving towards a goal. I, I well, get that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd give myself that much credit. Um, I Well, then let and, me give you and, the credit. And, and, <laughs> and I mean, because intentionality and consciousness, you know, I don't know how much of that I actually have. I was, but I was, um, th there was a saying my father had, in, and he was a psychiatrist. And he said, you know, if you feel like shit and if you're depressed, just stay there and make the most of the time. Like until it lifts, until whatever. Like if you're down, you're down. But you know, put it the time. To, don't fight put, it. Put the time to good use. Yeah. And so, I, in that spirit, <laughs> in that spirit, I went. I achieved, accomplished whatever happened. And um, so, the culmination of all of this was. Um, I formed a production company, an artist management company in the music business because entertainment industry is like a gambling casino. And mm -hmm. um, if you want to play, the high roller room is up on the 60th floor. Oh, the AR. And, that, and that's, and that's, no, that's film. That's movies. Oh, okay. And then, and then television is the hundred dollar table and theater off, off Broadway is the $50 table. But the music industry, at least at that time, was the was the slot machines, the twenty five centers, and so I didn't, you know, come for money or have resources or connections, and so I started in the music business. It was the place that was uh, no prereqs, and and I started in artist management and built production company and all that, culminating in. Um, Two artists, first artist with a top 10 hit from zero, and second artist with um, four top fives, the last going number one pop, four and a half, five million album sales, you know, all the bells and whistles. And um, at that point, I had met my bride, who uh, we've been married, we've been together, I think, 32, 33 years, married 32. And um, and I was living in New York City, and the this had significant success, 
and an equally significant dramatic flame out, crash and burn. Mm. So generated a fortune, rode the company to collapse, you know, lost a fortune, all the house's money. Typical and, story um, of an entrepreneur, right? And yeah, typical entrepreneurial act, tremendous education. Tremendous education, like all learning, right? Every step of the way. And um, what, were the, what were some of the the nuggets that you learned that you could share with others that would be of value to them? Well, um, the first one is um, if there's a shiny thing at the center that you want to pursue, don't set up any preconditions or requirements before you pursue it. In other words, just go for it. Go directly. For Do not pass go. <laughs> don't, right. don't divert. Don't, yeah, don't divert. Don't construct unnecessary rites of passage and, and you know, conditions, circumstances, requirements. Um, but we often do that, right? We, often. we don't think we're enough. We don't have enough. We, we're, we don't feel like we can be enough. And, and so we set up all these things to help us at least feel like we're making progress. And still, there's that goal out there that is still out there. Yeah. And, and, you know, a life teacher of mine, you know, said to me, um, in the context of uh, a weekend workshop that was sort of the, a turning point, uh, you know, he said, don't, you know, you make everything exponentially as difficult as you possibly can before you transcend it, solve it, <laughs> fix it. Why do you do that? Cut that shit out. Right, right. So, um, so here I am. I've got, you know, top pop artist, number one record in the country. It's just another day. I have no emotional connection to it at all. As an accomplishment, as significant, as meaningful. 26 full-time employees, countries, multiple recording offices all over creation and the life as far as none of it would see none it, yeah. yeah none of it none of it uh held any meaning and um we had had our our daughter and then our son came along our daughter was coming up on three and she started to melt down we ended up in this parenting workshop held by the local Y because, you know, kids are born, they give you a burp towel and a bottle of formula and tap you on the back and see ya. Yeah, right, and, you know, right, there's right. no manual. Got no manual. And, yeah, and sure. uh, we were clear at our daughter's reaction to our son's birth, we were clear we needed some help. So we ended up, we ended up in a workshop on um, uh, nonviolent parenting Um uh, that was rooted in concepts of nonviolent parenting, and um, that that I subsequently became certified to teach. But uh, that's down the road. So anyway, we the person who one of the instructors of this workshop was a guy who um, threw in an exercise at the end that um, is not, that a lot of people are familiar with from weekend personal growth development workshops. Um, it was sort of a variation on one of those where you stood in the center of a circle and the parenting course was not a touchy-feely course. It was not a self-awareness awakening course. It was a practical redirecting children's behavior. Mm, it was okay. a very analytical. So, um, but he threw this thing in at the end where you stood in the center and then you would take each parent, parent's hands in the course and make eye contact. And they would say to you, what I love about you is, and you go completely around the circle. And when you were done, they would say to you, and when, when you were done, you would say what you want. That's so, pretty powerful. Singularly most 
extraordinarily uncomfortable experience in them. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I can read really... the level of energy, the level of intimacy, the confrontation with self, all of it, like in one very nice little packed package. And, um, and my statement was, I want to feel that. Which could have been at that time, I want to feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. So we were milling around after, after the end of the, of this workshop. And, and, you know, I was talking to him and he said, you know, there's this weekend and it's a standalone. And um, I think you might really appreciate it. It could provide the answer to your wanting to feel better. Mm. And I, you know, and I said, well, you know, do you have something I could look at? Do you have something I could read? Whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and he stepped back and he looked me in the eye and he did the, you know, old, really? the, old, the yeah. old school sales thing about, okay. So if I'm telling you this is a weekend that could literally change your life um, and you've wanted to feel better for a long time and this is could provide a, the solution to that, um, why would you want to wait? Like, why? And I, so I, you know, it took me about a second to just process and I said, okay. Mind you, I only knew him from the workshop, but I knew I trusted his integrity in being in service to mm -hmm. as a person. No, and he demonstrated it throughout the workshop. And absolutely. And I, so I filled out the paperwork. The workshop was a week later. And then um, that workshop, which was based on a center out of uh, Westchester, New York, was canceled. Hmm. And so I had to wait. Um, three months for the next one. And I cooked. He said, I could go into this weekend workshop and come out, putting myself on a new life. I could solve what was missing, what was in. And I took that literally. And I cooked. Now I knew nothing about the workshop itself, what was going to go on in it, who was going to be there. I knew nobody else there other than him. A friend of my wife's and I, who uh, had experienced one of these things before, uh, offered to drive me up, um, drop me off in Westchester. And um, it was a real meet your maker weekend. And there was a guided meditation. And it, again, a lot of your viewers probably um, have crossed paths with it, but it was the clear purple bag. And it was a 17 minute, you know, put everything in the bag. Mm. And then the punchline at the end, you know, you are not what's in the bag. You are the person looking at the bag. <laughs> and um, for me, oh, that, huh? for me that, was, uh, that was sort of the trigger. And so I, the guided meditation ended and I was in an altered place, feeling me for the first time fully without anything added, but also fully feeling it in touch with a, a, an I that up until that point, early 30s, I had never experienced. And so I sat there frozen and there was a break and everybody in the room went about their business. And there were so 16 students, there were 38 assistants who were people who had been through the weekend before and were there just to support to instructors you know, it's a lot of people. And there was an exercise, a series of things strung together. Um, and um, you would get up in front of the room and do these things, say these things, you know, go through these exercises that were each touching pieces of the human mm -hmm. mechanism and being. 
and um, and I sat frozen and everybody went about their business in the break and then they came back and the room came to order and I exhibited what uh, is, is known in that particular community as um, uh, burning desire. So any, at any time, any one of the students in the room over the course of the weekend, if they feel so moved to get up and do, um, they have that license. And I stood up and I took the floor and I ran the gamut of this series of things at 100% and sort of blew the roof off the room. Um, and um, the weekend is designed to give people an opportunity to find out where the block is, if there's a block, and then to overcome it and then experience themselves at 100% without it, mm -hmm. experience themselves completely uh, self-realized. Well, and uh, kind of lock so, it in. So, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's really miraculously powerful transformation oh, stuff oh, yeah. and and um so um so i ran the sequence up to the last line where i had the room all i had to do was deliver a line close the deal be celebrated be done and i stopped and i let the whole room's energy go down to zero, which is when he shouts out, Doug, why do you make everything in your life as difficult as humanly possible? Why would you do that? This was a done deal. You had him. <laughs> All you had to do is give him the punchline. Done. Amazing. So I cooked on that you know, for a couple of hours and then got up and cleared it and, and did it. Subsequently, I became an instructor of, the, of that weekend. Um, and, but that was the beginning. I came out of that completely energized, mm -hmm. initiated on a, on a path of awakening, of transformation, of growth, of discovery, of self-awareness. And um, and, um, my wife, uh, and kids came up for graduation. So here they are in a room, you know, everybody's high as a kite because of endorphins. It's a very touchy feely, huggy sure. kind of thing. So everybody's high as a kite and everybody is huge smiles plaster on their face. And, and, and the cohort is, are all in matching you know, t-shirt, color purple t-shirts. And she's like, you know, my husband's joined a cult. And, and the friend who had dropped me off drove her up. And so she understood what was going on, but we all get in the car. And, you know, the, um, I'm sitting in silence and shock. Oh, yeah. Because I'm back. Were you shocked or were you just kind of basking? Well, no, I, well, I was, I was in this place where I was aware of how different the place I am in and feeling now. And where you were. And, and my wife and kids are, I can, I can sense the fear and the anxiety of not understanding, not knowing. Yeah. Who's dad now? And yeah. I remain, <laughs> and I remain in silence and we hit the door of the apartment and I'm standing there with the key in here and I'm realizing that I'm in a moment of choice that um, I can go into this poor, I open the door and I can go into this dark apartment, leaving everything reverting to what was before I had left or transforming everything that was my life going forward and begin anew 
make a decision. Like, what are you going to do? And, and I made a, I was six feet off the ground. I made a decision like I'm taking care of business. And I went after my wife to re-seduce her, to reconnect with her, to just level the whole thing back up to engaged and connected at a level that and happy I wasn't capable of before. Yeah. And I went after my kids in the same way. And I, 24 hours later, I ended a partnership. I closed an office. I completely terraformed everything. And, and the energy level was high enough that my wife, after two or three days of like being drowned um, in unconditional love was like, could I do this weekend? Like, could I? And there was a workshop actually the following week in Michigan at a center. And I was like, absolutely. And so she, she flew out to me like, just based on the energy, you know, the ancillary energy overflow. Um, so that was sort of a, my critical leveling up. That's a, and, a, an and, amazing experience. And I know the audience can relate to that. One of the things that, that occurred to me during the process, when you were talking about going around the room hand, and holding the hands, looking at their eyes and them giving you your best, basically what they see in you. I had a friend that, uh, he was written up in Time Magazine, 71, March of 71 issue. He was a prophet of his own time. He helped start the waterbed industry in late 60s. But he says to me, he had this little thing he called Gifty Gias. And it was a similar process, only it went a little further. You would sit in the center. You would have your cohorts, friends, whoever around you, people that cared about you, right? And you would ask them for your worst your best and how you could improve. So it was like one minute manager on steroids. Right. And the only <laughs> thing you could say to them is thank you. Thank you. <laughs> or, or please tell me more. Yeah. Right. The, there was no, and of course, the tendency is to be defensive, right? We all want to protect ourselves in, in those kinds of things. And of course, after, uh, after a couple of, eh, <laughs> no, thank you. Or please tell me more. And then that became just so comfortable, right? Because you realize they care about you. They want the best for you. They may not see clearly, but they also see things you don't. And they see things in you that you can improve that you don't. And they also see the best in you that you may not. And so there's this wonderful amalgamation of offerings that you can choose what to do with because you've got them now it, it increases your awareness of those things uh, uh, from the perspective is up of others and also your own self-awareness and, and it's funny you know the old adage the, the paradox of truth right it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you but what you believe about yourself and then there's also the doesn't matter what you think about yourself that what others think about you Right. And, and you're always on that fine line of um, balance that in, in the world, in doing and being who you are, or let me, let me reframe that in being and then doing what you do. And the thing that we, that I'm sure you, you agree on is first finding that being. That's the all important until you have that, you love yourself fully. You can't do it. You're, you're worthless for anybody else. I mean, you, you can do things, right? But they're usually road actions. They're not authentic. But when you're in a place of being, everything's authentic. And people can feel it. Like, you know, they saw Absolutely. the difference in you and, and how you behaved, how you interacted and the love that you demonstrated that they may not have known was even in you yet. And then here it is. And it's like... Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, and it's a tremendous experience. And wow, it's so full of unknowns as well, because that's just the way it is. And all you can do is show up and be present. Well, it it was it was an, it was the turning on of the light and the beginning of a process. And um and over the, you know, the following decade, ultimately training and teaching that workshop, 
Um, I did a lot of work in processing and cleaning house and, and leveling up. And I had a, a really interesting relationship to money rooted in internal awareness or carry of fears about self-worth and fears about that value and all of that. And it was a major piece of the puzzle. It was the, the 3,000 pound gorilla piece of the puzzle to leg, to handle. And- how, how did you do that? What, what, what was the core of your previous, let's say, belief system? Uh, well, and, and the, how did that transform? Well, in, in, you know, in the course of the sort of all of those dimensions of learning with readings and um, coming into contact with different modalities and, and types of work and self-discovery and development and evolution. And, um, and I had a convergence of, of things that were, were exhibited in a pattern. And the pattern was that in work, after the, the company crashed, um, I shifted into a mix of lawyering, of consulting in corporate context and entrepreneurial work with startups and early stage companies. Um, I've never been a fighter as a lawyer. I, I've never done litigation. I've never been in the courtroom. I only do building things, transactional things, helping people create. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the course of all of that, I would take us to really horrible, tight, crunchy, financial edge of disaster times. Um, and then pull one thing or another out of a hat and live to fight another day and stabilize. And in conjunction with those, um, those crash points, my back became a issue, became a, a big issue. Right. So the first time was a herniated disc, back surgery. But by, by the time I hit the hospital, I was wheelchair bound. I literally couldn't walk. It was, it was compressing the spinal cord. Well, they do say when you don't feel supported by the universe that, that you're, you feel oh, it's, it's your lower back. It, it's one, is one is reflective of the other. Yeah. So, so back surgery, 100% recovery into the, into the cycle. Next one, two years later, back, back surgery. 100% successful into the cycle. Into the, so four, four cycles, four back surgeries. Each one effective. After the fourth one, within two weeks, back problem. Except this time, I'm on two different painkillers every four hours, 24 seven for a month. And there's nothing to operate on. We're at the end of the old paradigm road. Mm. And contemporaneous with that, somebody brings me a book by a guy named Sarnow called Healing Back Pain. <laughs> and, and he proceeds to lay out as an orthopedic surgeon that he wasn't quite so sure this was mechanical orthopedic in nature and did some research. And what he found was 100 people with scans and no history of back problems and 100 people with scans and extensive problems and histories of back problems and interventions. Lo and behold, their spines looked identical. 
All of them had spurs, all of them had bulges, all of them had herniations, all of them had everything. What's the difference? And in digging into it, what he found was that the people that had the recurring problems were stuffing emotional challenges, not processing, not in touch with, not rec rec you know, reconciling and mm -hmm. experiencing them. And, uh, and not really that, and realizing that all the mental chatter about it was being shoved down into their body. Was, they, they, were, so they were directing it at, a, at, at their, own, their own structural Right. Reality. And we don't and even recognize that we live from the shoulders up most of the time. And, and exactly. that's perfect yeah. evidence of it. So I'm reading this book. I'm halfway through it and the pain is subsiding. Mm. And I rewind the videotape and I look back at the what was going on in my life at the time that the back problem was, at the time of the surgery. And it was a loop. Very evidentiary. Identical. <laughs> redundant. People and names might change, faces might have changed. Yeah, process was all the same. The internal me in it, no difference. And I connected the dots and owned my authorship of this heroic, pyrrhic roller coaster of, you know, sitting atop uh, a conflagration of my own making only to vanquish and survive it, to live to fight another day, to set up and queue up the next version of this whole pattern. And my ownership, authorship of every moving part of it. Now that's a powerful place and, that a lot of us never get to. And so that was connecting the dots on all of that and transcending back problems, because I don't have any back problems. The first surgery was necessary. It was a pinched spinal cord. There was no alternative anything for that, but um, it's, prof it, it's, it's um, uh, what's the sugar pill effect in a placebo. clinical? It's the placebic effect was enough for the next three surgeries, which looking back were completely unnecessary. So, <laughs> so a doctor recommended. So that was the end of <laughs> that was the end of back problem, but it wasn't the end of the core self worth, self valuation as a dimension of self love um, belief system and fear, mm -hmm. and. That moment of truth really was a, really a come to Jesus like crisis point of circumstantially being on the door of being homeless um, and circumstantially really up shit creek without, uh, you know, up shit creek without a paddle. And in full embodied, uh, emotional and, and tactile connection with the fear and terror underlying that of not being entitled, not being capable, not, 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 all the nuts. Mm -hmm. And I roasted in that for a good two days. And then, um, what do you use as your base? Something, something clicked. Yeah. Something, something clicked. Yeah. And uh, literally in, in an instant, all of the fear that had been the root and source and growth medium for, for that was gone. Literally gone. If you could put a location as to where that had resided in your body. Oh, it, it was, it, it was all of my, my whole body was nothing but that. Okay. It was literally all, all pervasive. It wasn't so even. Would you perceive that as just a, a really a, a sense of 
constriction from the fear? Um, it was just tense and, and it was it was it was more paralysis. It was okay. more it, it completely owned was underlying and owned everything. And um and it was gone. And in its place was also gone all of the mental chatter, all of the cognitive scrambling for solution, for way out, for fix, for whatever, all of the carry of um, what I knew what had informed, defined, and controlled all previous action to that point. It was literally a complete void, but it was peaceful. It was silent and um, it was spacious. And it was just being without fear. 100% being present in the moment. And um, I've been there ever since. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and and and, um, and uh, it um, afforded a, a pro it afforded me the opportunity to sort of take stock inventory in terms of what now. Where, where am I going? What am I doing? What am, what, what am I being? What is my uh, choice, value, add? What am I in service to? So that was really the turning point for me to be where I am today. In your, your joyous outburst there, it was still kind of, it was like, it's still a tough place to, to recognize and, and fully embrace, right? Even though because we always have that temptation of letting the mind take off and chatter and do that. So that there's a, what I heard you develop over time was a discipline that you were able to see the transition, make some references to it, have some assistance with the reading and the, and the others, but also, you know, just develop that, that self-awareness discipline that kept you, at least able to recognize, okay, I just got to chill out, you know, take a breath, get quiet and, and relax. And, and then, you know, kind of like Rilke says, you know, you, you can't answer the questions with the knowledge you already have. You have to let life roll it out and just live the answer. And, and it happens sequentially and not all at once. Right. It, it, and, it, and, you know, the, the circumstantial narrative-based drivers of all that fear for most people, circumstantially, I was at the worst one could be sure. in, in a terrestrial material world and frame. And the consciousness awareness that I, that became accessible in the quiet was that even where we are now this minute, we're okay, mm -hmm. we're alive. No danger. No danger. And lo and behold, we didn't end up on the street. You know, we ended up with some friends and we navigated and put the pieces together and, you know, and that, you know, the, the other fundamental piece was, um, and it was sort of like back at that apartment door, right? So do I believe the world is fundamentally, the universe is abundant, or do I believe it's filled with scarcity and threat and danger? Which wolf do I wanna feed? And in that moment, the, the commitment, the decision was, it's an abundant universe. I'm going to feed the white wolf. And I'm done. In I'm done. That's yeah. a completely internal yeah. decision. Right. I am done feeding the other wolf. Now, here's the, the interesting <laughs> thing. You were talking about being, you know, in the terrestrial um, stuff, right? And 
all of this pressure we feel is are from outer circumstances and programmed attitudes that we've picked up throughout our lives from various sources, right? We're in simulation uh, of everything and every person we've encountered. And especially when our parents, you know, that, that's the core and church, social organization, school, th those kinds of things. What, um, since you mentioned terrestrial, I'm going to go the other direction for just a moment and <laughs> mention a guy named Wilbert Smith, who in the 50s ran Canada's UFO investigation funded by the Ministry of Transportation. So it was a legitimate program, well-respected scientist and leader in, of his own right. Well, he kept memoirs over his period because he had actual conversations with what he called people from elsewhere. And of course they would drop these tasty tidbits here and there and, and he included them in his memoirs, never published them. They weren't published till two years after his death. And of course incomplete, but still they're there. And, and they happen to fall on my lap this, just this last year. And I'm reading them. I've got all these thoughts and images and all just racing through my head as I'm reading these memoirs. And one of the things that they said to him is we live half inside and half outside. So we've been paying attention to all the outside and neglected the inside. And then that guy you mentioned earlier, that come to Jesus moment, he even said, make the without as the within. And so there's this concept of going within. We've heard this in mindfulness and all the workshops and seminars, you know, and wondered, I, I guess, I did for a long time, maybe you did too, what's the practical and pragmatic applications of this in, in our work in the outer world? And how can we turn this inside into a wonderful experience outside? How did you find that? And, and what did you do with it? Well, that, that sort of it was a logical outgrowth of getting to this place of realization and recognition of the abundance as a as a real operating condition of reality, mm -hmm. and um, I connect, ended up connecting with a colleague, Fabian Zulansky of mine in Argentina, and he and I sort of connected through a, another venture that somebody was floating at the time, and. Um, and that sort of went away, but we persisted in the connection that we had. And we both said, okay, so here's this world headed toward a global extinction. Let's like check, check off number six and the earth resets and starts all over again. Um, and all of it is by our hand. So we have created everything that's outside our window, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So... Now, I would offer just another consideration of that that, that doesn't often get, get thrown into the cauldron. Uh, and that is that the, and we've known this for decades, that the poles are shifting. And that simple planetary action, you know, as a result, you've got one side of the polar ice cap that's melting and one side that's reforming. Um, weather changes and all that kind of stuff. And, and yes, we have had a major contribution in the pollution factor uh, that we are responsible for, but a lot of the weather changes aren't necessarily up uh, because of us for that simple reason. Now we can, you know, humans want to take responsibility for everything, right? And we're so pompous that, <laughs> you know, we were told we had dominion over the earth. Well, we didn't realize that meant stewardship. Right, so we back again to the harmony with self, others, and, and nature. Um, so this kind of, of attitude, along with okay, what can we do to assist? Which I, I think is where you were, you were headed, and I, I didn't want to necessarily interrupt you. I, I just wanted to put a, another layer of on top of that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's it's less of a you know responsible whole whole and soul responsibility for but a very large part of environmental destruction deterioration um well, we've polluted adverse, air, impact, water. adverse impacts on our on our yeah. species and other living things on the planet um, certainly the part that we are responsible for is significant 
and, and we failed miserably and in our we, responsibility. And it's, it's been by our hands. So the, yeah, the, yeah. the seed question was, since you can't fix it with the same thinking that it was created with, what is us doing us differently actually mean? What does that look like? Well, you mentioned the other day when we had a conversation that, you know, we were talking about structure and organizations, getting people to work together more effectively. And you had mentioned, you know, that's really an industrial mind, industrial age mindset. And I have to agree, I, you know, that, that kind of caught me and I paused and was like, you know, you're right. Um, that doesn't exclude another kind of natural hierarchy that might exist, but it certainly puts the um, silos with, male, with alpha males at the top competing with each other front and center, right? And even I noticed with organizations that even those organizations that are coming together to do good work, it, they're still silos. They don't, they're not talking to each other. They're internally afflicted as well. Right. So how, what can, how can we do and what, so, what might we be able to do to circumvent that or, or to create something that inspires those to become horizontal instead? So there are, there are some principles that have emerged out of the last, um, five to seven years of field work and how do people co-create together and how do things get transformed. And some of the, fa the fundamental principles for true transformation are that the transformation has to be the fruits of the loin of the people within the organization that is seeking to transform. They have to create their own transformation process, transformation center orientation values. Right. Now, do you find and, that, uh, I totally agree with you. There's a document that came out in 2010 called the ISO 26,000 social responsibility standards ratified by the 92 countries. And it's gone virtually unnoticed. Is that something that, of value? Because it is, they, they're intentional. You know, beyond the, the ISO group has all these standards, ISO 9000 series being one of them that corporations pay major dollars to get certified for, and they can't get government or airspace contracts unless they are, right? So that's one aspect of it. And, and it's all, for lack of better, data-driven, right? The... ISO 26,000, on the other hand, are purely intentional, and it can just be by the gesture of the organization as to what they intend and how they operate in the community. It also seems that, given that document, that the grassroots effort could be initiated using that document to kind of push it on up the ladder. Uh, do you so, think that that's one of the things that, that's in play, or, or is it not? So explicitly, that is something prescriptively generated that mm -hmm. is either projected on, imposed on, or given to the people within. And because of the behavior pattern and imprinting, by definition, since it comes from outside, it is a continuation of the industrial model. It's a projection of power, control, authority over, even if well, in, yeah, its wording, in its wording, in its wording, in its wording and expression, it may be the most wonderful aspirational values laden thing. It comes from outside and is by definition emotionally imposed. And before somebody gets to the reading, they're already autonomically set up to reject. <laughs> I see that. I, I, I do. And, and you know, it, uh, for a long time, it felt like, okay, well, here's, because we're always looking for tools, right? And well, like so, a great tool. so this, is, this is the other thing, right? Okay. So... First, whatever the it is has to be generated by the people within. 
Otherwise, you don't get the buy-in. That's a process of catalyzing that, not leading it, not facilitating it. All of those things are contaminated, affected by mm -hmm. the industrial paradigm projection power control theory. Now, is this similar to the flatline organizational structures that DHOC tried to work with? Well, you know, the the new self uh, self leading self governing flat you know innovations like holacracy and sociocracy and variations on the theme that are are aspiring to escape the gravity of that industrial frame. Mm -hmm. um, can't. And the reason is one, in most contexts, at the beginning at least, they are projected and imposed on when they're implemented. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they're missing the key ingredient and secret sauce that is required for any true transformative reality to take root, which I'm is- I'm gonna take a leap and, and say both, that inspiration. Both of them explicitly say, we don't deal with the human being dimensions. We deal, mm. with, we deal with decision making. Mm -hmm. We deal with allocation of authority, but we don't deal with the people dimensions. Well, an organization is comprised of human beings. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the product service is. It's and the and, and the in, the industrial the the Taylor dystopic projected industrial model doesn't deal with the people dimensions either. Mm -mm. People are units of production. They are cost centers and generators of value that all feeds to a bottom line of efficiency and profitability. And, blah, 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 blah. and there's often the command so, and control structure so in it. Where all you organizations want to beat people up to get it. And, and all organizations is. today are fundamentally missing the human being dimension mm -hmm. in the co-creative process. So our vision is, you know, all of the self-awareness, consciousness raising domains, yoga and meditation and retreats and sitting on mountaintops and, and gathering for, for uh, you know, astronomical events and times of year and all of that is great, but it is all fundamentally narcissistic. I was just going to say, it's, it's all self-centered. It's individually right. self-centered yeah, yeah. around individual consciousness awareness ascension. Yeah. Uh, my interest is consciousness awareness and integration of the being part of human beings as co-creators in the generative process. Right. And not as an add-on, but as a reintegration with humans doing. Sure. So sure. it's humans... I, I have humans being while doing and that materially informing how they're doing what they're doing and and consciousness and awareness of the felt sense dimensions and realities and energy flows right by in between and the um, it's not even on the plate today in most organizations no it isn't and one of the things that, that i enjoy is i have a similar thing as you know um the the value of the combination of transformational life coaching skills and uh, partnering team building skills, where right? you're I'm in a, a room with construction guys from the contractor subs utilities. Uh, you know, it could be twenty, could be eighty guys depending on on the size of the project and gals, of course. And there's this process of establishing first the the principles of partnering. Uh, commitment, integrity, communication, and trust, and then building that into a code of ethics, which they dis determine what and how they are going to engage each other, how they're going to behave right with each other. So they set the standards. And then we talk about the goals and objectives and, and turn the objectives into metrics to where they can manage flow. 
and because it's not a, a detail oriented, it, it's how the flow of the project's going. And then we break out in the issue resolution phase, which is, okay, let's just kind of like a Dale Carnegie thing. You throw it all up on the board. You talk about each thing, throw it on board first. You don't try to solve it. And then you go through each one, determine whether it's a talking point, an FYI, or there's actually an issue that's going to need to be taken care of. And then you develop a plan for it because in a construction project, they're two to five years long. Right. And so there's all this contiguous activity going on that if any one of those pieces gets out of line and causes job stoppage, that's tens yeah. of hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So the meticulous aspect of being able to bring that being into the room, in the moment, talk freely and openly. And for me as the facilitator to be able to read all the micro expressions to understand what's not being said and then bring that up to the table because those are the job stoppers. Correct. Correct. And it, it's for me, I was tremendously yeah. intimidated to begin with. It was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I got in the middle and it was like, oh shit. You know, it, and then over time it's like, all right, just stay in center, be, be available, be receptive, listen well, ask the right questions. And then you can lead the discussion to whatever answer needs to be because you don't have uh, an agenda as to what answer you're going to get to. Only that you're working to build a, an award-winning project on time under budget with no injuries. <laughs> Other than, right? <laughs> so, and, and I, I'm from a, you know, reading about your work and the things you do, you're doing the same thing with organizations. So what do you find are some salient points uh, of order in that process that can work for others? Because these kinds of things work not only for personal lives and, and self-development, they work for getting people, places, and things to work together better. So how, what have you found are, are the significant, again, what are the nuggets that, that you've found that work best? Well, first of all, we're, we're purists. And what I mean by that is in being in systems, um, we're selling being. We're not coming in under one of the post office box standard consulting offerings, you know, Six Sigma or, or Agile or mm -hmm. Holacracy Sociocracy or Theory U or, 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 or. It's not anything productized. It's not in noun land. This is a verb offering. It's, it's like uh, the God participle, huh? Correct. Being. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. And the ING is the operative idea. Right. So, First of all, it is a transformative piece of the puzzle out of the box in somebody retaining us. In order for them to hire us. They definitionally need to open the door to prioritizing and valuing the soft stuff, the human mm. being dimensions in their organization. If they do not recognize that as non-discretionary priority, this isn't a, let's try this. This isn't a, we'll run this one up the flagpole for the next two years until the next CEO musical chair carousel when it goes away and he comes in and cuts out all of that. And then the guy after him comes in and reinstitutes all of this teal stuff and whatever, what it's not in that category. We don't live in that space. Bit different. So as a threshold matter, you sort of have to understand what we're saying to hire us. Mm -hmm. If you're not quite clear on that, we're not the people for you. <laughs> now, fortunately, courtesy of COVID, the gift that keeps giving, 
the cold reboot to the industrial world. Right. The we set. The C suite <laughs> globally is in abject fear and terror ever since it hit and remains so, notwithstanding the apparent quote recovery, they're in fear and terror because they're seeing things they've never experienced. They're facing challenges they've never had before in the human dimensions of their businesses, right. their staff, their retention, their management, their every aspect, getting people back into cubicles, like, and the insanity of even doing that. So and everything the companies that are requiring vaccinations and, and employees are going, uh, uh, everything, yeah. everything they had before and did before is gone. Mm -hmm. The world is today. It's in the present and you can't fix what ails today with industrial business centered stuff. Right. Or, magic solutions, or magic, magic solutions in a box or sure. programmatic cures um, that are branded and people are being trained to, quote, bring. It's like, like you have to ask or learn how to ask questions you know don't have answers yet, but the, and yet they still need to be asked because they're clear and present and necessary. And you, and you also, from a, quote, leadership standpoint, need to recognize that um, you may not be able to do that the way you were doing it anymore. May that's not. The tr that's the may truth. That's the truth. That's the truth of it. Oh, absolutely. Right? The truth of it is that the old hierarchical and projection of power control authority over is really not suitable, appropriate, or applicable to the world we live in now. Mm -hmm. and it might have been in the industrial age, but in, in the new millennium, it's a whole different story simply because now, it, it, and we've talked a little before on, on the cosmological things, New Year's shifting and all, all that kind of stuff. That's just one aspect of it. However, there's an evolutionary process going on in humanity that is kind of a, it's been happening. However, it's ever more present with this change of behavior globally and the, the, difference in, in how people are rising up the masses are awakening <laughs> you know all this stuff was kind of foretold age of awakening age of awareness um uh, golden age uh, we're there we're here like, we are. It, it's happening before our eyes so they've got to learn new tricks and we're in the catalyst business we're not selling anything mm-hmm and and the of course the, the learning new tricks it's not really yeah it may be learning new tricks but it's learning them in a more coherent and fun way because this abundance is a place of joy it's a place of expression creativity innovation and true agility if we were to look at it like that and yet there's this hmm, ceiling that has to be breached, right? And, and how do you think that's most effectively breached? Are the same kinds of tricks good for personal as well as professional and organizational? I... I um, do not believe in industrial dark arts. So, so. <laughs> what do you mean by that? So, so my answer to that is probably not. It really is a new paradigm and orientation to how to serve. Cool, cool. I may have, uh, of alluded to a different I, thing. My, I, I, I was looking at a consistency of personal being that trickles through. It's like- That's, in, really, uh, that's really the essence of it. Okay. So it, it is literally creating the opportunities and the invitations and the containers for people to reconnect with the felt sense of fully being in the work context right 
No, what's interesting, and, and I totally get that <laughs> it, and and have felt that in some situations already. What's interesting is that stepping back from this, you know, a lot of times we we get too absolved and we get too close to ourselves, too close to the project, too close to the organization. We can't step back and just observe what's going on, let alone look at what else might be happening simultaneously. And years ago, I was introduced to the, the Mayan calendar and I met Jose Arguez. He became a personal friend. And, and that the general consensus of what that is with, with the end of time, it really isn't the end of time, it, it's just the end of a cycle of time and the, the new beginning. And there supposedly is a 50 year window between the harmonic convergence in 87 and whatever else in, in 2037 that's gonna be marked, right? And then there, you were talking about these individual um, uh, entertainment I ideas for self-interest. Well, there's a greater interest there too. It, as the as we progress toward the sol solstice of 2012, easy for me to say, <laughs> the uh, level of awareness and consciousness pretty much paralleled the information curve as far as its increase. And so we get to the tipping point. Then what? Well, now those things are in our being. And so we take those things back into the workplace, however it is, right? And then simply because of that, that energy that's gone back into the existing systems now has essentially caused all of the inherent disruptive natures of it, patterns, processes, whatever, that don't fit to rise to the surface. And so we're seeing that across the board in the evidence that it is happening with this, whatever we want to call it, right? And, and there's one effort that's trying to handle a global population and put its thumb on it and, and dominate control with the old industrial mindset. And then there's another one that's going, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're reaching out. The virtual world has just blossomed with all kinds of conversations and people sharing things just like you and I now of ways that we're coming together and learning how to work together better and having those conversations uh, on a deeper level than we ever have before. I believe that. I, I experience it. And I, I, and, and, I, and, I th and I, and I think energetically that's the, the growth medium. That's the seed and source out of which the new is going to manifest. And um, I've just been, a little bit preoccupied and focused on, from a BIS perspective, um, the large multinational, because they're, if they're, if we're successful in transforming one of them through our processes and catalyzing their own internal transformation, they're in the most powerful position to change course to stop doing what they shouldn't continue to do, to transform and evolve what needs to be done and what needs to meet needs, and to really turn the. the and then you've, of course, the then you've got the empirical data. And if one does it, the rest follow because right. it actually it actually maps to profitability. It actually, on a regenerative basis, generates more value maybe not just constrained to fiat currency, mm -hmm. is dying as well. It's mm -hmm. going away in the face of the emergence of the crypto world. Mm -hmm. um, but in the propagation and generation of value, not from extractive and destructive processes. Well, it, and it really makes sense to come at things like you're doing from the top down because we all know the world's corporate controlled Currently, even our political systems, it's not, you know, it's not being, the people aren't being served. No. <laughs> what, what, they're being served up. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we need a better dinner. We, we need a better menu and, and better chefs, right? And, and so you and I both like to cook. So, you know, this is kind of what we're doing and, and spinning Absolutely. around this and, and having fun with it. And just the joy of the conversation of two of us that happen to feel similarly. You know, we might describe it 
a little differently because we've got our different dictionaries from our backgrounds, but the, we've been able to kind of say, oh yeah, we're, we're right there. We're on, on the same page, maybe even in the same paragraph and we're working to be in the same sentence. Well, we're, I, th I think it comes down to from source and to source and recognizing we are not source. Correct. Like not, be, not being confused. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I, I put together, and, and it can be very confusing. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm, you know, I am a, uh, the creator of my entire, well, yeah, to some degree, but it's co-creation. Let, let's get, you know, <laughs> no man is an island to himself. We've known that forever. And yet there's this, uh, in a quantum physics level, right? There's the, that point, uh, it, sort of quantum physics, and this may be French science, but there's a point of light, the center of our being that travel, that bounces back and forth between here and the great light. And as we develop our awareness of the multidimensional aspects of that and the being, that sensation enters in and it permeates to people around us. And depending on how present we can be, that, if, that sense of feeling or that sense of energy from us can be 30, 40, 50, 100 feet in diameter and more. I've seen it. You know, you walk into a perfect example. You walk into a room, you're present, all of a sudden you catch somebody's eye, right? And it's a big room, hundreds of people, and boom. So do we explore that? There's obviously a connection because they felt you, you felt them. So why not explore that resonance that the two of you just experienced in that moment? Oftentimes we don't do that. It's just like, oh, okay. Now I learned, I don't know, a couple dec decades ago maybe, that those are the moments of like, okay, I got to go find out why that just happened. What's going on? And so you go ask. Yeah, it, initially, you kind of feel like a fool. You go, you know, walking up to a stranger and say, I don't know what was going on, but, you know, I saw your eyes, catch my eyes, and what's going on? <laughs> or, or some way. You get better at it over time, but, you know, the, there's that certain foolishness that uh, maybe even childishness that becomes present initially. And it really is responding from that childish place in you or childlike place in you, the curious how would you, uh, uh, how do you experience those kinds of things, first of all? Well, the, the best um, sort of analog that I can share um, from workshops that I've taught, and there'll be a student who's sharing their, their source trauma, their shadow. And in inquiring into it, um, we'll get to a, a depth. And in the workshops I taught, I always explicitly said to all of the assistants, and um, the, last, the last bunch I taught in Israel, there are 21 students anywhere from 45 to 65 assistants, volunteers that have been through it before that are there just to support the students. And I always have said to the assistants beforehand, if anything is shared or expressed that has resonance for you on any level, um, you know, step up, step in. Like that's value for the whole. And um, somebody, a student will be sharing. And an assistant will stand up and I'll go, yeah. And they'll go, so, and they'll share their story. And their story is identical, different place, different time, different age, different yeah. names, identical, identical. And they're there for a reason. They both were energetically pulled to that weekend for that moment. And we're all connected. Hmm. 
um, on levels that we've long lost and forgotten and lost the faculty to have awareness of. But those, those, those energetic level resonances, connections, resemblances, sharings are constantly around us. And when they reveal themselves, you know, the people in the room will, I'll, I'll you know, be talking to, to a student and I'll go, so before you were blah, 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 right now you just did this. Who was that before? And the student who at that moment is named John will go, oh, that was Bobby. Same person. That was Bobby. And everybody in the room will go, <gasps> like, you know, I'm not a witch doctor. I'm just paying attention. I'm just paying attention. Right. That was a different person that was not the same person. And, and for the person who's I'm in the room at that moment with, that person for them has a different name and they live with them in that skin. And so all of these things are um, transfigured things, things they're not transfigured. They're actually things existent that are being made visible are being exposed. It's sort of like the layer that separates us from the multitude of these things that are existent in every instant is being opened up, is being torn, mm -hmm. and so that it can be revealed. Its presence can be revealed. People relate to that as miraculous, but it isn't about miracles. It's about fully opening and creating internal space and capacity and sensibility right. and consciousness to catch it when it appears, when it presents itself. Right. Just and like two people across a room and you make eye contact and there is a knowing and connection in that instant and it's reciprocal. Because yeah. if the person on the other end isn't experiencing it as well, then the contact and connection doesn't close. It's like a circuit energetically. It never even so, starts. So when the, yeah, so when, the, when, when a circuit like that um, opens, it's a, it's a revealing of. Yeah, it's like, hey, who are you? I know this you. Is who I, yeah, Wait, is I know you. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And so, so I, you know, I kid that, you know, I, in relation to all of this stuff, I'm the garage mechanic. So I, I don't bring a whole lot of, I don't have a lot of, hist I've done some learning along the way, but I don't have any practiced or schooled sophistication in, Buddhist traditions, in Indian traditions, in Egyptian Middle Eastern traditions, in Western religions. I don't have a lot of the sort of more mystical and, and alchemical uh, stuff uh, in my quiver. Um, I'm, I'm really immediate, present moment, like what is, um, what, what, but what am I sensing? What am I feeling? What am I seeing? What's being shared? And what am I responding with? It's a very, very, like, how fundamental can I get? <laughs> how simple can I make it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, with an emphasis on fun. Oh, yeah. And, well, and it's joy. all mental. Joy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely with joy and appreciation and gratitude. And, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I, I can totally relate to that as you know and, and like you you know there's this sense of okay we've we found this and how do we share it and not just and there's no prescriptions right there there's no necessarily a, a pres prescribed path it, it's all just learning to know yourself feel yourself be your even you know like um Mahai, Chiksat Mahai, and flow the psychology of optimal experience, right? It, it, it's that moment. And when you're in that, it's like um, I'm a jazz drummer or jazz ah. fusion <laughs> drummer. So in, uh, in those places, you just lose time. There's no ego. There's just a conversation. And it's a, sometimes it's a wonderful one. 
sometimes it's a little cacophonic tattoo when you're, when you're trying to find the the rhythm or the beat or the melody or, or something to where you can at least begin with a foundation it's the the the, the critical thing within the framing context of human co-creation, human generativity, mm -hmm. is that anything that arises on a human felt being level in co-creative context. And even on a canine whatever, level. Whatever, whatever comes up and presents, that too, whatever comes up and presents is value and contribution and important for the whole. And so instead of it being, we don't have time for that. We don't have room for that. Um, it's not relevant. It's not, it does, has nothing to do with getting to the goal, with the doing, with the completion, with projection. Instead of relating that way, it's recognizing mm -hmm. power and intrinsic value slash learning in that, whether it's an individual who's triggered and it, and it, it's, 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 activating shadow for them within the collective and group context right the minute that happens they just have their attentional energy resource turned in they are no longer part of the team there is a huge generative energetic loss to the co-creative process mm -hmm. and bringing them back online and honoring whatever it is that they've experienced and having them share that, present and gift that to the collective, and in the to be elemental frame, we call those tickles. To your fun thing, we yeah, call I, any I, any I like disruption any disruption yeah. for any individual. It's a tickle, yeah. in whatever frame it can be technical, it can be intellectual, it can be emotional, whatever. Um, but uh, they share it. Everybody inquires into and to the point of full understanding and receipt. And then you and have then, the intellectual and humor then, and or, uh, intellectual humility and psychological safety for that to be able to happen. And when they share it, it is no longer theirs. They have given it away. They've yeah, given it up. Can, so it they are not equal it out, to, so to they're speak. not it, equal to it. It's not yeah. personalized and attributed. And it is given to the whole, and it is up to somebody else as an energy field minder to handle it. It is never the responsibility of the person who has it to handle and resolve it. And um, once people get used to that, it's an amazing thing. Oh, yeah. And the gifts that come out of the processing, the collective processing, are always revealing and expanding of understanding awareness consciousness of a larger reality of our business of what we're doing so what i i, I <laughs> what i felt you just say was and heard you say in my own way was that the old paradigm last century's um push and pull of energy to get what you want the mech enlightenment kind of mentality um, the, the speed of whatever, right. To, to get what you need done. Everything's fast, right. Now you slow down enough to then move fast, but you've got to slow down and you have to slow down in order to embrace the individual and the being and to create that coherence amongst the collective and then move forward and otherwise enable, and that enable or be short-lived enable that integrated being while doing to, to be the priority that that level of consciousness is critical right and and um and that takes time it does require no longer letting the clock run the show mm. and <laughs> back, back to uh, Wilbur Smith's guys, right? Uh, they say that their measurement of time is a is the change of entropy, and in that framework, it makes sense. We've tied ourselves too much to 
lunar and solar cycles and which are natural, but we've applied them unnaturally. Correct. We've mechanized them. Yeah. And we've objectified them. Right. And, and we've endo endowed them with power control authority. Yeah, and built all you know, kinds of systems <laughs> around us, right? Yeah. And, and so now, you know, the, the, we've had the end of time. Now we're experiencing it differently. End of time, literally. Yeah. End yeah, of yeah. industrial time. Yes. Yeah. And speaking of end of time, Doug, it is our end of time. We're past our yeah, end of time. What a sorry, I, right? I didn't. I didn't play within your friend. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> you know, I have. I just have a general, you know, let's do about this long, right? And um, it, it usually, you know, it, it comes uh, within that. Sometimes a little less. Sometimes a little more. Doesn't matter. We get done what we need to, and. and that perfect segue just led me into a, a wonderful <laughs> close. And, and I uh, really appreciate your time, what you do, who you are, and the being that you bring into the world. Well, thank you. And back at you. You know. Thank you. <laughs> and namaste and in la catch. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefil, your host. And I'll see you next time.